Suturing isn't just for surgeons. It is a critical skill that you may need to use in an emergency. I'm a pediatric surgeon and today I'm going to use a split screen, give you a couple of different points of view so I can show you how to do interrupted sutures correctly and effectively. All right, let's go. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson and today we're going to be looking at suturing. Now, if you are a medical student or you are a resident, this is going to be perfect to show you the proper technique on how to do interrupted sutures. If you are just somebody interested in learning how to suture, this is going to show you the proper technique and what you need to have in order to throw sutures effectively. Also, at the end, I'm going to put in some things to avoid or uh, common mistakes that people do when they suture. Now, why interrupted sutures? Well, there are a lot of different techniques, and I'm going to put out a series of videos where we go through each of those techniques because we could do interrupted sutures. We could do a continuous suture. We could do a continuous subcuticular suture. We could do vertical mattress sutures. We could do horizontal mattress sutures. There are a lot of different ways to sew, but if we have simple or even complex lacerations, doing simple interrupted sutures effectively and correctly is going to allow us to close the vast majority of wounds. So what do you need to suture effectively? Well, first you need suture. Well, in my suture video, and you can check that out right here, I went through all of the different types of suture and which ones were for what indications. So, what type of uh, suture do you need to close a simple wound? What type of suture do I use to tie off blood vessels? Uh, what suture uh, would I need to close a wound under tension, like a wound over a joint? In that video, I talked about all of the different types of sutures, so I recommend checking that out. Today, I'm just going to be using a 2.0 PDS suture on a tapered needle because we're not really talking about suture today, and this one is easy to see, and you're going to be able to see how I manipulate the needle. So today, we're using a 2.0 PDS on a CT1 needle. The next thing you need is a needle driver, all right? So this is just a simple needle driver, probably a medium size. And then finally, we wanna have some forceps. Forceps are gonna allow us to manipulate the needle, uh, also manipulate any of the tissues that we need to while we're suturing. Okay, let's get into it. Okay, when it comes to suturing, we have a few different things. First is we have our needle driver, okay? Second is we have our forcep, all right? Third is we have a pair of scissors to cut the suture that we're going to be using. Four is we have our suture, okay, so here is that 2.0 PDS on a CT1 needle. And then finally we need something to practice suturing on. Now Ethagon gave me this fantastic suturing board and this is perfect for demonstrating suturing, practicing suturing. You can pick one of these up. It also has something to practice deep ties on, something to practice hand ties on, something to practice suture ligatures on. Really fantastic. But you don't have to be this fancy. If you want to just grab a banana or an orange, you can use whatever you have. But the important thing is that you practice. Okay, so if we get our needle driver and we get our needle, the first thing is loading it, all right? So the way we want to load this correctly is we want to about be about three quarters back from the tip, three quarters back from the tip with about a 30 degree forward angle. And that is going to give us the best opportunity to enter directly into the tissue. Now, once we have our needle and our forceps and our needle driver ready, we can begin to suture, all right? So our needle is loaded three quarters of the way back from the tip, and we have a 30 degree forward angle, all right? And two things we want to avoid. Now, we can stabilize the tissue with forceps if we need to, but we don't want to really grab it and traumatize the tissue. The second thing to think about is we want to get that needle entering the tissue 90 degrees perpendicular to the tissue like that. We don't want to skive through the tissue like this. 
When we sky through the tissue like this at less than 90 degrees, we only get that really superficial epidermis and that is not the strength layer of the skin. So if we enter at 90 degrees by pronating our wrist, turning our wrist down, we can then take a bite of the epidermis, the dermis, supinate our hand, and take another bite approximately five millimeters from the wound edge. Now, a lot of people want to grab the needle with the forceps. I don't like that because what we want to do is we want to use the curve of the needle to drive that through and have the least amount of tissue trauma possible. Also, if we were going to do a continuous stitch, I'm then ready to pick that needle up and now it is ready to go for the next stitch. In this case, we're doing an interrupted suture, so I can put my forceps down or transfer it into my other hand, let go of the needle, pull this through, and now I'm ready to tie my knot. So. We want to tie square knots, and I'm gonna show you how to do that. We wanna keep a minimal amount of suture out of the end here, just so we're not getting all caught up in our suture, okay? And then we wanna grasp this in our left hand. We're gonna do two throws, which is a surgeon's knot, grab the suture, and then cross our hands and pull that together. We can see when we do that, as long as we don't lift up, that's going to approximate the tissue and close it without strangulating it and making it ischemic. Now our loop is ready and we can go back through and now cross our hands again to complete that square knot. Okay, we want to finish that up by doing a third one, crossing the hands, and because this is a monofilament suture, I'm going to do a fourth and then a fifth so that that knot is complete and completely square. When we're finished, we want to grab our suture as well as our scissors and we want to leave about three millimeters of suture on there. Okay, so that's a completed knot. Now, if we are going to finish this, we then want to take the next bite five millimeters from the last one, five millimeters to about a centimeter, depending on the size of the wound. We're going to turn our hand 90 degrees, enter the dermis and the epidermis, come through the other side straight across. We're going to pull the needle through using the curve of the needle, okay? We can stabilize the tissue, pull it almost all the way through. We can set our forcep down, and then two loops here. Nice surgeon's knot. Coming through, alternating our hands each time. So that these knots go down square, and that is gonna make them secure. We can repeat this process going down the wound until it is completely closed. Again, when we're finishing up, we want to take our scissors and trim it so we have about three millimeters of suture left. So those are the technical aspects of how to do an interrupted suture. We want the needle properly loaded we want to enter the tissue at 90 degrees by pronating our wrist. We want to drive the needle through the tissue using the curve of the needle, and that is going to minimize tissue trauma. We're going to want to be about five millimeters from the wound edge, and our sutures will be five millimeters to one centimeter apart. Now, what are some of the common mistakes? First one I already mentioned skiving and not having that needle at 90 degrees to the tissue. That leads to very poor wound closure and tissue trauma. The second one is unevenly spaced sutures. Not only does that look terrible, but it provides 
um, inconsistent tension along the wound, and that can interrupt wound healing. A third one is inconsistent depth of wound bites. So having a wound bite that's one millimeter from the wound edge and a one milli and then a bite that's one centimeter from the wound edge. So we want to keep that distance from the wound edge right about five millimeters. The fourth common mistake is not throwing square knots. Now, whether you're hand tying or you're instrument tying, it's critically important to tie square knots because square knots are secure and granny knots are not secure, okay? So, we tie square knots by putting the needle driver within the loop, two loops for the first one that creates a surgeon's knot, and that is going to be secure when we lay it down so the tissue stays approximated, and then that second part of the knot is with a single throw in the opposite direction and you know you're tying square knots if you're crossing your hands. All right, That's something that should help you know that you're tying square knots and that they're going down square. Finally, the part that I think is critically important to tying knots on delicate tissue is not making them too tight. Sometimes I see people suturing and they tie that knot so tight that the tissue becomes ischemic. Now, that is not as important with simple interrupted sutures as it is in hemostatic sutures like horizontal or vertical mattress sutures. That can lead to significant tissue damage and ischemia. But the point is, lay that knot down so the tissue is approximated but not strangulated. All right, those are the five common mistakes. I hope this was helpful seeing it from both points of view, how to put that needle into tissue, how to get that knot down. In future videos, we'll talk about continuous sutures, subcuticular sutures, vertical and horizontal mattress sutures, all the different sutures that you need to have in your skill set to fix any wound. All right, we'll get to them. Thanks so much for joining us. If you like this video, give it a like, give it a share, subscribe to the channel. I put out medical content for not only medical students and residents, but other humans that are interested in medicine. And like I said at the beginning, suturing is not just for surgeons. It's a critical skill for anyone in emergencies. All right. As always, stay safe, study hard. I'll see you next time.